Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you all today in last webinar of our open course, be about the youth relevance on internet governance. We hope you all enjoyed this course and learned as much as we planned when we first thought about this idea. And we hope your interaction with our speakers was fruitful and that many things can come from this experience. Well, today we'll have um, Aileen Sejas and Juliana Novais as our speakers, members of the Youth Observatory. And I'll introduce them both, and then pass the floor to them so they can conduct this last, last meeting of ours the way, the way they think it's better to improve the interaction in our webinar. Um, Juliana Novais is a law, stud, a law student in the University of Sao Paulo and also enrolled in a double degree program at the University of Lyon. She is a researcher in the tech policy field and a digital rights activist. She is, current, she is currently part of the Directive Council of the Internet Society Youth Observatory, that is also known as Youth Seek, a special interest group, and an Internet of Right Fellows at Article 19. Ha main areas of interest are digital economy, content moderation, and telecommunications regulation. Aileen Sejas is a criminal lawyer, a criminal lawyer and the regional engagement director for the Latin America and the Caribbean for the Youth Observatory. And she is also the Latin America and Caribbean representative for the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. So, that being said, I would like to pass the floor to Liana and Aileen. I don't know who would like to start. So, there you go. Thank you very much, Pedro. Let me just share my screen with you. Can everybody see my screen? All right. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you very much for the introduction, Pedro. Uh, what I'm going to be talking today is about the Youth Observatory, which is also known as the Internet Society Youth Sick. Uh, just to clarify, when you hear the word Youth Observatory or Youth SIG, it's basically the same thing. It has two names. One of them um, represents the Youth SIG of the Internet Society and Youth Observatory. It's like an uh, informal name that we use uh, for this group, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, just to clarify, because sometimes people don't, they're not really sure what's the difference between Youth Observatory and Youth SIG. There's no difference, it's the same group. Uh, so about me, Pedro already introduced me, but just so you know, my name's Juliana. I'm in my last semester of my law degree at the University of Sao Paulo. I'm part of the Directive Council of the Youth Observatory. I'm the Latin American uh, member of the Directive Council of the Youth Observatory because now we have one representative for, from each region. Uh, I'm also an IRL, IRR fellow at Article 19, uh, doing some work with uh, community networks and telecommunications. Well, basically, so what's the Youth SIG? Uh, you've probably heard of it already, otherwise uh, you would not be here today. But basically, the Youth SIG is a youth-led organization. So everybody that is part of the Youth SIG is a young person. Uh, and we were formed made most, mostly by young people around the world. And we have around 1,200 uh, members from all the regions. And our main focus is to increase youth participation in internet governance. So how did the six start? Uh, the Internet Society Youth at IGF program had it, its first edition in 2015 in Jean Pessoa. Uh, and in that edition, Internet Society uh, sponsored the, the participation of over uh, 50 young people, I think, and those young people, they got to know each other at this forum and they decided that it was necessary for young people to have a space where they would be uh, free and they would have the incentives to, to talk about internet governance, to develop their own ideas, to basically be uh, a space where young people could exchange ideas about internet governance. Because they understood that even though the IGF allowed uh, young people to be sponsored to be at it, they did not uh, have uh, enough spaces for young people to participate in. Uh, the panels were mostly composed by uh, people above 30 years old. So it was not a very inclusive uh, environment for young people. So they thought it was necessary 
to create this group, especially for young people to share their ideas and, and be like an open platform for that. So that's how the Youth SIG uh, started. It was not yet part of ISOC. Uh, it became part of ISOC a little bit after, in 2016. Uh, basically, ISOC has the chapters, national chapters. So the Brazilian chapter, the Argentinian chapter, the Peruvian uh, chapter, mm -hmm. but they also have special interest groups. They're international, but they're focused in uh, one specific issue of internet governance. So we have the youth SIG, but we also have the cybersecurity SIG. We also have the community network SIG. So they're not uh, geographically based, but they're based on a specific issue that ISA considers relevant uh, enough to create a group to work on that specific so we are the youth state, so it's the special interest group that is uh, specialized in the issues involving uh, young people, people from 18 years old to 30. So that's uh, the age uh, of our, our members, so that's basically how it started. Uh, so what do we do as a SIG? Uh, we have three main objectives, which is to include young people in the internet governance of the system, uh, to create an open space for young people to develop projects on that field, and to give visibility to young people, uh, they're already working in the internet governance ecosystem and what kind of work they're doing. So those three uh, main focus areas of our work is inclusion, uh, open space and visibility. So basically that's all we do as part of this, uh, of this group of a lot of people, but those are the areas that we are engaged most with. Uh, what are some of the projects that we do? So we had in 2017, our first publication, which is called Analysis of a Connected Youth. So the idea of this publication was to gather the opinions of young people on uh, what are the social impacts caused by the internet. So we, we opened a call for papers. So we allowed young people to submit their academic papers on this issue. And we, we basically did the editorial work on those papers and then ended up publishing this book. So it was analysis of connected youth. Uh, this book was launched in 2017 during the LAC IGF, but it also had a session at the IGF in Geneva um, to summarize some of the findings that we had with this book and uh, some of the ways that uh, young people still struggle to, to get into the internet governance ecosystem. So this was our first publication in 2017. And then uh, we have annually uh, an event called Youth Lack IGF. Uh, this year is the fifth edition of it. Of course, it's remote this year, but uh, the past editions have been on site. So we had the first one in Costa Rica, 2016, 2017 in Panama, 2018 Argentina, Argentina, 2019 Bolivia, and this year, of course, remote, uh, but next year we're going to have it in Chile. So it's always uh, where the LAC IGF happens. So uh, we always organize this event a day before the LAC IGF. So it's sort of like a gathering of young people uh, to discuss some of the topics that are going to be uh, discussed during the IGF, so the LAC IGF. So we have this gathering where we discuss some of the topics and the agenda for that year. Uh, we also discussed some of the issues uh, with uh, young people getting uh, included in the LAPGF ecosystem. How can we uh, build more a synergy between the countries? Because we always have, this is an international event, so we always have young people from many, many countries in Latin America, South America, Central America, and Mexico as well. So it's always an opportunity as well for us to discuss some of the items that are in the youth agenda in, in Latin America which is harder to do during the IGF because we have so many other people from other countries. So this is more uh, Latin American focus. So it's a really great opportunity uh, for us to gather before the LAC IGF, uh, build uh, relationships with each other, like friendship, and uh, build projects in the future. So it's a really great opportunity. Uh, we also do, uh, we all have always done this, uh, except for this year, obviously, because it's remote. We offer fellowships for this uh, event as well. So we always open a call for applications before the LAC IGF so that young people from the region, they can apply for a fellowship to attend. And then we sponsor uh, their trip to the LAC IGF. Uh, an opportunity for young people that cannot afford to be in another country for this event. They can be sponsored by the Youth Observatory to participate in that. 
and we always get some funding from the internet society and also from companies such as google such as uh, ICANN. they always uh, support us in the organization of this event uh, well creating networks is a project that we worked on last year it was basically we know that there are a lot of young people working in the internet governance ecosystem but we don't know what they do we don't know where they are we don't know which organizations they are part of so this project had the objective of mapping this organization so let's say uh, if I have a youth organization working with cybersecurity and I want to know who else is working with cybersecurity in the region so I would go and see in this map if there's any other uh, youth organization working with the same issues I'm working with so we can partner so that we can build projects together and things like that so we got over 150 organizations mapped in this project so it's a really great opportunity to get to know other young people working with similar issues they are located in other regions or even in the same region or same country that we are so it's really interesting um, besides the map we also organized a fellowship program for those organizations so it was an opportunity uh, for people who are part of these uh, mapped organizations to uh, develop projects together with other young people working in other organizations so the idea was for them to gather in groups of three and work on an original project and then the best project would get a fellowship to go to the IGF so we had uh, 10 projects total and the best one got a, school, uh, a fellowship to attend the IGF Berlin last year so it was three people that were sponsored by the youth observatory to go to Berlin. It was pretty interesting. Uh, Atlas, uh, which is kind of like a complement to creating networks. Uh, youth Atlas is our second publication. It's about uh, giving visibility to the young people that are already engaged in the internet governance ecosystem. Like I said, we know that those fellowship programs, like the Internet Society one, the ICON one, they always bring new people to the internet governance ecosystem. But we never know what these people are working on after they go back home, after the fellowships are over. So this, this project was to, to get to know these people and uh, how did the fellowship impact their lives and how, uh, what are they working on, where, they pla where are their plans, uh, what are the difficulties that they find being a person trying to uh, get deeper into the internet governance ecosystem. So it's basically a book with a lot of testimonials for from young people that have been uh, emerged in this ecosystem recently either by fellowship programs or other kinds of engagement opportunities and uh, it offers as well some statistics on how many of these young people came from fellowships how many of them did not came, come from fellowships so it's kind of like a first step into to getting to know uh, the youth ecosystem in internet governance so is basically it. Uh, well, when we started uh, the youth observatory, when we started, we were Latin American essentially, so there were only Latin American members in, in the youth observatory. Uh, it was a regional group, and that is because uh, the Internet Society Fellowship Program in 2015 was dedicated exclu exclusively to Latin America. So. There were only Latin Americans uh, part of that fellowship, and that's why the group ended up being uh, geographically located in Latin America and not international. However, after the Internet Society expanded its fellowship program to other parts of the world, we uh, felt like it was necessary to open the use of observatory as well for members outside of Latin America because we were very concentrated in this region and we saw that a lot of other initiatives were coming from other parts of the world and we needed to catch up with that because we were a little bit too concentrated in one area and uh, it, it was kind of excluded because other people could not join us if they were not from Latin America so we decided to open it uh, so this year was the first time we had elections uh, that were open to all the international members that we have uh, so we had some mandatory uh, geographical quotas to be filled for example the director of council which I'm part of uh, it's necessarily composed of people from different regions it cannot be uh, just people from Africa or just people from Europe or just people from Latin America it has to be one person from each region so uh, it's very uh, it's a very interesting initiative to to really get to internationalize the group because we have 
we always had people leading the group that were from Latin America, so we needed to to create some kind of standards so that people from other regions could be able to join and not just as members, but also from uh, also part of the board. So that was the first time we had this. Um, well, the main difficulty I would say we have is with language, because I mean, even in Latin America, we have four different languages at least, uh, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and English, and not everybody speaks all four of them. So obviously we have some, some issues with language and we have even more issues with language when it comes to the uh, all the members of the youth observatory because we have people from all over the world and we obviously we try to communicate in english with them but not everybody speaks english so that's kind of uh, an issue that we're still struggling with uh but anyway we try we're trying to build an environment that is as inclusive as possible and we really need to improve on that so uh getting feedback from our members and also uh, getting uh, initiatives, initial ideas from our members is also a way in which we're trying to do that. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Youth Observatory yet, uh, but in case you want to be part of the Youth Observatory, uh, we're still setting up like commissions such as translations to really get to uh, get this issue of language solved. So this is something that uh, is happening with the internationalization process. Uh, well, 2020, we know that this year is kind of like very unusual. Uh, we don't have any uh, on-site events planned so far, obviously, because of the limitations that we have with the virus. But uh, our main goal this year is to really get this internationalization process to be as open and as inclusive as possible, to get as many people from other parts of the world to really participate and feel part of the youth observatory because we know that we have a lot of members from uh, Latin America and those members are usually quite active so it's not really about um, something in Latin America but really get to other regions and get them to interact with the Latin American members because we feel like we don't want this to be a bubble from one region and uh, kind of like isolating the other regions. We want everybody to work together and really interact uh, within our project. So uh, our main goal this year is to strengthen that uh, space of discussion that is open and that is global as well. Uh, so we're planning new projects, uh, we're trying to increase participation and all of that. Uh, well, just coming back here, um, many people, they ask me, how can I get involved in the youth observatory? Uh, and they always ask me, how can I get into the youth observatory in the first place? And I always give them the standard answer. You have to go through the ISAC platform and then you have to uh, select the youth SIG and the options that you have for chapters and SIG. Uh, I know this is quite, uh, this is the standard answer that I can give you. You have to be an ISAC member and then you go to the ISAC platform and then you sign up for the youth SIG. But this is just, for you to be a form, formally a member of the youth observatory which means that you're going to be in our mailing list but to actually be part of the youth observatory and actually help us with the project uh, share your ideas and actually be an active member of the youth observatory uh, be in our telegram group so when you enter the youth observatory you're going to receive a link to be part of our telegram group so join your regional telegram group and be uh, aware of the call for participants that we that we put there. So the Telegram group of Latin America or whatever other region that you join, uh, they are just a communication channel. They are not a working group. So the working group opportunities they always appear when we have a specific project. For example, we had an open group uh, call for this course for the Youth Black IGF organization. We always put that in the Telegram group, and then. You're, you're directed to that uh, working group specifically. So being uh, only in the Telegram group of the Latin American region does not mean that you're an active member of the youth observatory. Of course, it's great to be there because you have access to information and people, uh, people share what they're doing, uh, people talk, and of course, you can have access to some opportunities that we offer. Uh, but to really be an active member, join a working group. Uh, we have many going on. Uh, I mean, right now, uh, we're setting up, uh, we set up, like, actually, two weeks ago, one for the Beyond the Net funding opportunity, 
Uh, we had the one for the lacquer gear. We're probably going to set one up for the newsletter that we're organizing as part of the East Coast Territory. So really, if you want to be an active member of the East Coast Territory, join one of those working groups. Do not just be in the mailing list because you're going to miss a lot. And uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, improvements to do in our communication channels and all of this. But of course, we are a nonprofit organization and we have limited funding. So this is always an issue for us on how to communicate best with our members since we have over a thousand. Uh, but if you really want to be part of it, uh, join the Telegram group and join working groups when, when they appear, when, when those opportunities are open. So this is really how you build relations in, in the use of territory. This is how I started. This is how most of us started, to be honest. Nobody uh, knew exactly how that worked before they joined the working group and then they started working on something and then this led them to do something else and, and started to build relations and that's basically how how our work is kind of like divided and this is how you can participate as well if you have any questions uh well we have our official email here but i can also send you my personal email or my telegram username so if you have any questions or if you want to talk to me about something uh, regarding the use of territory. If you feel like you want to participate, or you don't really know how to do it, please talk to me. Uh, I, I was also very confused when I go into the use of territory the first time. I didn't know how it worked. Uh, sometimes uh, it's there's a Telegram group and there's a lot of messages on it and you don't know what to do. But it's really, it's a very interesting environment and I really recommend it to everybody that, that wants to be involved in use uh, engagement in IG, in the IGF ecosystem or in uh, the IG ecosystem as a whole. So, uh, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I don't know if that we're going to do that at the end or we can do that now, but I'm available anyway. Uh, and I'm going to put my personal email in the chat for you in case you want to contact me, or you can also do that through the Telegram group. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliana. Um, so, uh, without taking any more time, I would like to pass the floor to Elin Sergius to do her exposition. This, Elin. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Pedro, for giving me the floor. Um, tonight, I'm going to speak about what we have been doing from the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. Okay, uh, so. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of the Youth Coalition, but anyway, if you're not very familiar with this, uh, the Youth Coalition is one of the dynamics coalitions that are part of the IGF and are part of the intersectional work of the IGF. In the specific case of the YC, it was established to advocate for the youth, for the voice of children, young people and young professionals in internal governance and processes, especially at the IGF. And it's a platform uh, for young people to discuss about internet governance related issues. Um, it allows us to, to discuss at unequally footing to amplify the youth voices at the IGF. It has been successful in securing a commitment from the IGF to include young panelists at annual meetings as well as organizing a series of panels at different levels of engagement and producing clear statements during the IGF closing plenary sessions. As a registered a dynamic coalition has a meeting slot at each forum to bring together youth stakeholders from across the IGF to identify and discuss relevant issues and they work together to build uh, the youth voice in internet governance processes. So um, now I'm going to talk about what we do if we want to divide uh, all the things that we do uh, within the dynamic coalition on, uh, for youth. Uh, we can divide it into three main parts. So on one side, we contribute to youth engagement in intersectional work at the IGF, as I mentioned. We participate actively in the IGF process, giving inputs and representing youth from around the world. We also provide capacity building tools for newcomers. Uh, for instance, one of the things that we built throughout the years was the IGF ABC for Newies, which is a guide on how the IGF works, what is the MAG, which are the intersectional work and the 
best uh, practice forums, uh, how you can be involved in that about the youth initiative. So um, I'm going to share the link later with you uh, so you can take a look. Um, well, and also we share relevant opportunities uh, at our mailing list and Facebook group um, about, you know, uh, if someone is organizing a podcast on internet governance matters or is organizing a webinar, you can find all the information here and you can also share with other people. And both mailing list and Facebook group has uh, people from around the world, so you can know a little bit what other people is doing. And we are happy to say that um, the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance is having its 10 years anniversary and all the efforts that had been made by the YC community since its creation has helped to strengthen the youth position in IT. The steering committee, as you know, each dynamic coalition is uh, organized as an informal way but has a, a structure uh, regarding who is um, organizing the main matters of the dynamic coalition. In the case of the Youth Coalition on Intergovernance, we have a steering committee that each, each member of the steering committee is representatives of each uh, regional group. So as you know, the UN has divided the world into five region groups. So for example, we have Mary representing the Eastern European group. Uh, myself representing the Latin American and the Caribbean region. We have Millie representing the Asia Pacific region and finally Noah representing the Africa region. This year, unfortunately, we don't have a representative for the Western European group and others, but hopefully uh, for the next elections, uh, we have the, the space of field, right? So uh, about the long journey of the Youth Coalition, sorry, I'm going too fast. You can let me know. If we have to analyze about uh, all the things that we have been doing as the Youth Coalition, we can divide it into four parts. So for example, we have a, at the IGF uh, 2009, which was a recommendation to establish the YSIC. Then at the IGF uh, 2010 was the first session the youth expert list, and finally the 10 years, uh, which is the anniversary this year. Oh, I cannot see the, the chat, sorry. I was just saying that you, you're not going too fast. You can oh. keep going in this version. Okay, okay. okay, thank you. Um, so uh, about this recommendation to establish the YC, it was a workshop proposal that has been presented at the IGF 2009 at the IGF in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. Um, I hope I said it's okay. Um, in this workshop, uh, there was discussed these four parts. Uh, for example, that there was a necessity to, to organize this dynamic coalition for youth involvement and also that was important the participation of young citizens in democratic processes of their countries through, through social media and the involvement of young leaders too and a general debate of the, the role of youth and finally that uh, there, there was an appeal for more youth participation and representativeness on the IG. So after this recommendation, the next year, there was the first session uh, as officially as Dynamic Coalition. So from this uh, session, which was a very long debate, I, I want to mention these two comments that I, I want you to, to keep thinking after, after we, we, we talk about this. So one of the comments says, uh, I think the whole idea of having a dynamic coalition is that the IGF has uh, youth voices represented and uh, youth issues uh, are represented, but not only on, in youth workshops, but also in the whole IGF. Um, and also to ensure that youth get some trainings and capacity building to them. So in the future, even 
during this IGF and during other IGF, you can take up the planning and preparation process of the IGF. And the second quote says, uh, the goal is that youth key players of internal governance should be considered stakeholders and should not be restricted to specific issues and youth participants and experts should be involved in all IGF discussions and debates. And we strongly urge the MAG group to include more young representatives. Um, so I want to, you to think about these quotes. Um, then we are going back to this. If you think uh, there has been a change or everything is the same. So now about, I'm going to speak about the youth expert list after the main, main session of the white SIG, as you know, each dynamic coalition has a main session at the IGF. Um, in this case, we are analyzing the session at 2017. It was created the youth expert list, which has a goal gathering young experts in IG from around the world in order to facilitate the approach to youth from the stakeholders for session proposal and sessions at the IGF and other forums. This list uh, was also complemented by the youth champion list uh, the following year, which is still receiving information from young individuals around the world. Um, about these two lists, um, so I can say the, the youth expert list is, as the name says, is a compilation of names of young people who are experts in certain thematic areas that belong to certain regions so you can go into the spreadsheet and you know who is expert in the topic that you are interested in and you can reach to them and we are happy to say that after we created this two list this year the igf secretariat decided to add youth as a search criteria at the list of resource persons if you're not familiar with this last list that I am mentioning, when you enter into the IGF website, uh, it says list of resource people. So uh, you can uh, search for people uh, depending on the region, regional group that they are in, um, the, ex, the expertise, sorry, and the stakeholder that they belong. So after this change uh, implemented by the IGF Secretariat, you, for example, you can look for someone who is from the Asia Pacific region, who is from academia, who is uh, interested in, let's say, emerging technologies, and who is a young person. So uh, you, look, uh, you look for that and you get a list of uh, persons who comply to those criteria, which I think it's it's very important step to include more uh, young people at the at the main sessions and at the sessions proposals at the idea. So about this year, as I mentioned it, uh, it's the 10 year anniversary. So I'm going to share with you quickly some of the things we have been doing this year. Uh, for example, we are currently working on the update of the basic charter. Uh, the basic charter is like the constitution of the dynamic coalition, which is more like a bureaucratic um, process to, to know the steps of how it's organized and the elections period and all that. Uh, we also have approved a, a code of conduct. Uh, we had um, a questionnaire with the community to know about the, the needs and the interest, which I'm going to uh, address later. And uh, we also have participated at the IGF Plus survey. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but this year has been very active on discussing the digital cooperation architecture models. And one of the models that has been under discussion is the IGF Plus, which is basically uh, an improved version of the IGF with a more mechanisms like the policy incubator that are are currently under discussion and as you know uh, i think we mentioned at one of the webinars um there was this online event called the global stakeholders dialogue where uh stakeholders discuss about these 
three architecture models on digital cooperation. Um, we also held a day zero session at Eurodig, uh, which was um, Elnur Karimov was representing the youth observatory at that session. And we also have um, improved the, the website a little bit to make it more nice. So I'm going to um, talk to you about this questionnaire that we started on April 13 uh, to identify the top priorities for 2020 and to organize the YC work around the community needs. And we identified that most of the people who voted were from Africa region and from Western European and others group. Um, most of the people say that they were interested on webinars. And there was an interest too in mentorship programs. We also asked about which were the issues that the community wants to tackle during this year. And for no much surprise, uh, the main votes topic was the data protection and privacy. Then we have the digital inclusion, um, environment and technologies. Um, and finally, uh, the online content was the, the last uh, topic on the list. So uh, to make a bit of reflection, uh, I want to ask you some questions for you so you can think about them. Uh, so what's your perception of youth in IT space? If you think that the situation has changed it after the creation of the youth coalition in internal governance, and um, if you can think of some examples of group practices that young people can do to increase their involvement and participation in the IT space. Um, well, in, in last place, if you can think of some inputs that youth has uh, brought to the stakeholders and also the role of youth initiatives. So that's all from my side. Thank you. I'm going to leave the links of the Youth Coalition about the website, mailing list, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are also at LinkedIn and YouTube, but that's very new. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Um, so now we have uh, some units to questions. So Juliana and Eileen can answer them. If anyone wants to ask something, please feel free to write it on the chat or open your mic and if you want uh, your camera as well and make the questions directly to them. Oh, if no one is asking, oh, oh Wait, Eduarda did one, I'm asking mine after hers. Uh, Eduarda Costa asked, uh, how was your experience with uh, YCEG? I think this one is from Eileen, but I don't know if Juliana wants to add any comment. Uh, she can do it as well. So please, Eileen, you have the floor. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Eduarda, for your question. Um, for me, it has been very interesting, sorry, because, um, well, I became expert at the idea of websites and understand how is uh, the structure, because uh, to be honest, the idea of website is not very friendly <laughs> uh, to navigate, and that's why they are currently working uh, to adapt the, the design of the website, so, it, so it's more easy to navigate and to get information. And I have learned so much. Uh, I also have in touch with a lot of people who are working in very interesting projects. And uh, for instance, uh, this year, I, I had the opportunity to be helping <clears throat> to organize this session at Eurodig. And it, it, it's really important because since we are at the Latin American and Caribbean part, we are only thinking about what's going on in our region and it's very interesting to know uh, that we have the same similar issues and kind of similar perspective on some matters so yes i think it kind of um says about my experience thank you well i'm not part of the steering committee of the youth coalition but uh, i just wanted to add that you don't have to be part of that to be part of the mailing list 
So if you want to join the mailing list for the youth coalition that is open, um, uh, probably Aileen can share the link with you, but it's, it's a really great opportunity to be uh, in contact with what's happening in all the regions of the world. Because people share a lot of the projects that they're organizing. Sometimes they do like uh, webinars for, I don't know, one of the regions and then you can participate to get to know what's happening over there. And so it's, it's really interesting. So if you want to participate on that, that that's really great. Um, so let's just wait here. Oh, Gustavo made a question. Gustavo, want me to uh, read it or should I open it? Uh, should you open the mic and ask it yourself? I think that, well, I am going to read it. Um, Gustavo asked uh, a question to both Julian and Aileen. And the question is, what else besides your young, younger age do you guys think build a common identity? In which ways do you believe we should have a distinguished element from old people in IGF? Old people <laughs> in this broad sense. Please, uh, whoever wants to start. Juliana, you want to go? All right, yeah, I can go. Uh, I think age, of course, is, is an important factor because it, it really, uh, it works sometimes as a discriminatory, a discriminatory factor because people look at us and they say, oh, you're under 30, so I'm not going to give you a place just to get my panel or something like that. So it really is, a fa is an important factor that brings us together because it, it works as a form of discrimination for our group. But it's not the only thing. I would say that uh, most of us, we've had uh, most of our lives uh, connected to a computer. So that is something that really distinguishes us from the other people at the IGF because most of them, uh, they have experienced this transition in a more uh, solid way that, than we had because we have always been, of course, I mean, not, not all of the people from 18 to 30 had the same experience with connection, but I would say we have a very similar experience when compared to the other people at the IGF. So this is something that really brings us together as well, because we have a different experience regarding the internet and how it works as a, as a tool for, uh, for social engagement and for, and for change as a whole. So I think this is something that's really relevant and that, that really brings us together as a category, uh, as opposed to, to the old people at the IGF. And also, there's also something that I think is really important is the fact that most of us are in the beginning of our careers. So we, all of us, we have the same uh, questions about the same uh, insecurities about how to approach people, how to behave in that environment. And sometimes when you get to, to a place like an IGF meeting all alone, you don't, it's really, it can be really intimidating for, for you, like in, for you to ask questions, panels, uh, when you have other young people with you uh, backing you up and the comments that you make that really makes a difference. So I think this is why uh, it's so important for us to build communities of young people in the IGF ecosystem because it can really be something that makes a difference uh, when entering this ecosystem alone. Uh, so that's it on my part. Also, I just wanted to make a very short comment. If anyone is uncomfortable with asking questions in English, please do that in Portuguese or Spanish or whatever other language that you speak. If you're not comfortable uh, raising your hand and speaking in English, uh, we speak Portuguese and Spanish here as well, and a little bit of French as well. So if you have uh, any insecurities regarding English, please uh, ask your questions in other language. That's fine as well. Uh, I'll leave the floor to Amy now. No, thank you very much. Well, I think the youth component is very important here because as Juliana said, we are facing kind of discrimination uh, at the beginning and say, okay, why these people want a, a place at the table, but why they want to give their opinions, uh, why they are not just organizing youth sessions, because uh, that's kind of the problem that has been happening from the beginning of the IGF. And, and now we are trying to change that paradigm to say, okay, but you need young people at your sessions. You need people to, young people to participate some policy making processes uh, because they have, uh, we have uh, new ideas that can help us uh, for these processes. 
about the distinguish element uh, from young old people. Well, uh, I'm a bit more uh, going to the old people category right now, uh, but um, I think it's uh, the experience. Yes, because we have the experience. We have been facing these different mentorship programs. Uh, both of us have been pro uh, part of IGF uh, Youth Ambassadors or Youth IGF Ambassadors um, programs. So we have learned on, on how to discuss these topics of internal governance. We are not just uh, people that appear and want to say whatever crossing their mind, right? So. Pedro, you're muted. Oh, my bad. <laughs> we have two more questions here. Uh, the first one is from Paola. She thanks you both for the explanations. And she asks, asks uh, what, do you guys, what do you think is the challenge that we, the youth, must tackle to be considered a stakeholder with a seat on the table? So the floor is yours. You want to go first or should I go? <laughs> no, please go ahead. All right, I think the first thing I would say is uh, for us to be taken seriously uh, because what happens frequently in this uh, discriminatory process that happens with youth in the IG ecosystem is either they say, no, these this young people are not going to bring them into our panel because they're too young, they don't have enough experience to contribute to that discussion. It's either this, or they bring us in as tokens, uh, which is a phenomenon called tokenization, which is basically mm. when people say, oh, let's bring them in because they're so sweet, they're young, they have something to say, but we're not really taken seriously uh, in tokenization. So I would say it's for us to be in a place when it's, where it's not either discrimination or tokenization, when we have an opportunity to actually speak up and, and be heard as equals and not as, uh, oh, the sweet young people or the uh, very naive young people that join the IG ecosystem. So I think this is the hardest thing. Uh, and also, uh, another thing that I would say is important, it has to, not to do with the external uh, above 30 public, but also within ourselves as to how can we organize ourselves better in, in terms of region, in terms of, uh, integrating different people that come from different regions. Uh, how can we organize ourselves better to, to actually build a solid community in which young people uh, help each other and can serve as a support uh, for each other when young people are entering this ecosystem? So I'll say two challenges. First of, all, first of them is to actually be taken seriously by people who are not part of the youth community and second challenge is for us to build a solid and a strong community of young people outside of our own regions and really interacting with people that have similar issues in other parts of the world. So this was the first question. I don't know if I should answer both of them now or if I should go back to the second afterwards. But let's say we go back afterwards and maybe you can go now. Sorry. Well, just to add to, to Juliana, yes, one of the problems is the to tokenization. I'm saying it's okay, I'm not sure. Uh, well, that's one of the issues uh, that we are not taking seriously. And the other issue is that there's a still this um, perspective of some old people or senior people, whatever you want to, to call it, uh, that says, but they are not organized. They are like, um, they have these tensions with, between each other, but yeah, that's that's a thing that says okay, we cannot take them seriously. But it's it's very difficult to put all youth under an umbrella because we are different, but at the same way we are trying to to tackle the same issues that we are interested. In. Like for example, digital inclusion or let's say a uh, more inclusive internet. Yeah, definitely agree with you, Andy, on that. Uh, just to answer, uh, I would love to hear some insights about how to manage both professional paid work and the voluntary work uh, IG sometimes requires. Could you comment on that, which is Giovanna's question? Uh, I think this is one of the most important questions in in the youth IG debate right now, because like 
Well, when you enter this ecosystem, you often get opportunities to volunteer at a thousand different projects that, that you can actually join. And well, it's great, obviously, because you are able to build a network, you're able to, to meet people, you're able to develop your skills. It's awesome to volunteer. But this is uh, a problem because most of the opportunities that we receive are volunteer work ones and not really paid work. When, especially when we just go into the internet governance ecosystem and that can be a problem as well because not everybody has the time to volunteer while managing both paid work and volunteer work so I would say uh, you there's obviously some some concessions that you have to do of course if you have a paid work at the same time that you volunteer you should always uh, manage your priorities in order for you to guarantee your sustainability and not give 100% of your time to your volunteer work. This is why as a youth observatory, at least until now, I would say that we have been able to, to conciliate. Uh, most of our members have a paid work at the same time that they volunteer. I have myself as well, and I've always had, since I go into the youth observatory, I've always fun, done both things, volunteered and, and paid work at the same time. So it's always possible to manage that. We have many examples of people that do that. But obviously, it's going to require you to do some uh, time management and also to to know when it's time to prioritize certain things. For example, like in my case, I'm still graduating from, from my undergrad degree as well. So this is, of course, my number one priority. I have to I have to have a diploma. Uh, so this is, of course, something that I'm going to prioritize at certain moments and not uh, my volunteer work, but at the same time, I cannot completely focus on, on, on my university degree and completely forget about the youth observatory because I have responsibilities as well. So it's really a matter of time management and how you can conciliate that and always like being honest with the people that you're working with. Always say like, for example, I cannot do that this week because I'm really busy with something else. And I think this is kind of like the way you should um, uh, you should kind of like manage that, but it's always it's always a challenge for everybody. It's a challenge. I think most of most of the people at the youth observatory they have a job as well as as the activities they do at the youth observatory. So it's really really hard to to get this debate uh, going on in the public sphere as well. Uh, we should have at the same time that we have uh, volunteer opportunities, we should have as well paid work opportunities coming up when we enter this ecosystem because not everybody has. Uh, the possibility to do time management. Some people have children, for example, they cannot do that. Some people come from, from countries uh, where, I don't know, one euro is equivalent to, I don't know, 20 of their currency. So they just cannot uh, have the luxury of doing uh, exclusively volunteer work. So it's really something that we should discuss in the public sphere as well. I don't know if Aileen wants to add on that. Or... Yes. Yeah. Yes, I was thinking uh, it's not only that part of uh, putting your life in balance about uh, your paid job and the voluntary, but also that uh, there is another obstacle for meaningful youth participation, which is the problem of visa and, and the fees to travel because, uh, let's face it, uh, during the year you have IGF uh, meetings, uh, well, the main one uh, annually, but you also have I committees. So if you are putting into the into the list of all the activities that you should be participating in, if you want to be fully active at the ecosystem, well, it's, it's complicated. Um, one of the critics before this pandemic was. Uh, but what's happening with the online participation because people generally uh, couldn't have uh, meaningful uh, inputs uh, about the sessions and everything. But now we are uh, under the circumstances of the pandemic, we also have to think about what's happening with the people who have very, uh, very expensive uh, cost uh, to buy the data for their uh, mobile phone or computer or whatever, uh, but also about the connectivity issues uh, that maybe they don't have access to um, to a good connection uh, to be at the at the conversation, which are uh, I think that after all of this pandemic they are going to think more seriously on <laughs> connectivity about people. I really hope that, but. Yeah, let's let's hope that they are going to pay more attention to that. 
So we also have here another question from Benjamin, Benjamin Sean Castillo. Um, she, he also thanked you both for the presentations. And his question is, how do you think we, as young people, can strengthen the uh, Latin American region? And what do you think is currently lacking in our representation as young Latin Americans on international forums? So, Juliana and Lili. Well, I can go first. I think uh, one of the critiques that we always receive is the fact that uh, we don't have uh, as many people from Central America involved in, in the youth like IGF, for example as we have from South America and Mexico. So this is one of the things that we really need to improve, getting more people from Central America involved in, in these issues. Uh, and of course, uh, when we talk about uh, Central America and the Caribbean, there's a problem with language barrier as well. Uh, most of the people in Latin America speak Spanish, but it's not 100% of them. Uh, there are people that speak French and people that speak late English as well. So it's always hard to, for these people to join our initiatives because they're mostly held in Spanish. But at the same time, when we do them in English, we ended up uh, excluding people that don't speak English in the, the other parts of the region. So it's always a problem with uh, getting people that do not speak Spanish in, in our initiative. So I would say this is definitely one of the challenges that we still have to face as a youth group in, in Latin America. Uh, speaking not not about youth now, but as as Latin America as a region as a whole, like I think one of the problems that we have is that uh, our governments, especially in the IG ecosystem, they are not really engaged in in the in the forums that that we have here. They usually, of course, they go, but they are not active participants uh, of the of the discussions. They don't. They don't really uh, use that space as a space for policy, uh, as other people from civil society do, for example. So I think engaging governments in the Latin American region is should be one of our priorities for the future, because if we want uh, internet governance to have an impact in all stakeholders, we should bring those stakeholders together to, to actually participate actively in, in the ecosystem. And we have a huge gap when it comes to government participation. Uh, some countries, they, they don't even attend, uh, like government representatives, they don't even attend meetings like the IGF or the LAC IGF. And I think this is really bad for the region because if we want uh, policies to actually have an impact in, in the citizens' life, we need governments to engage as well. So I would say uh, in, at the youth level, I think we need to engage people from Central America and Caribbean more and uh, from the general level, at the general level, I would say bringing more, more government representatives to, to the LAC IGF space and also the global IGF ecosystem. Well, as Juliana was mentioning, yes, the, the barrier of the language is very important, especially with the Caribbean people. Um, because uh, there has been always this idea that uh, Latin America is just Spanish and Portuguese, and we are uh, forgetting our neighbors on the Caribbean. Uh, well, it's, it's not fair. Um, so other point that I think that it's really important that we have to consider is, as Juliana mentioned, that governments are not really involved in the discussion. They are just showing up and not saying very much. And you can also see that there isn't a partnership with universities and young people so they can know about the IGF processes. There isn't a program at universities or neither at schools that say, okay, uh, this is uh, about internal governance. Uh, this is how it affects your life uh, for good or for bad. Uh, so how you can get people more um, aware about all these issues that we are facing right now. Um, and well, with the pandemic again, about the connectivity issues and, and all of this. Um, I'm not sure if I'm forgetting something else, but I think these are the, are the three main parts of the problems that we are facing right now. Um, so before going to the ending words, 
I would like to open for a few more seconds to see if anyone has another answer, another question, sorry. And if not, I will go to the ending remarks. Oh, after that, Juliana and Eileen, would you like to add something as a final conclusion to your explanations here? I have more like a question uh, for the guys. Um, so I'm not sure if uh, you're participating right now at any youth IGF initiatives. And if you do, it would be interesting to know uh, what do you think it's, it's working or not working. So we are not just speaking <laughs> ourselves. While, while uh, we wait until people can type in the chat, if Juliana has some final words as well. And I felt like we we talked about so many things that it's hard to summarize everything in, in like final words. I just wanted to say that uh, including youth in IG is always going to be a very a very huge challenge for us, especially from Latin America, because we are always uh, in a not very privileged situation in which our currencies are not as worth worth as much. We need visas to go to most of the countries where the IGF happened. Uh, well, not Europe, but like other countries where the IGF happens, we would probably need a visa to go. So uh, it's really important that we, as part of this region that is in a developing condition, we really unite ourselves and actually create an agenda, uh, a common agenda for, for the young people in Latin America. Because uh, at the end of the day, um, if we give up on, on trying to be in this space, no matter how hard it is, uh, there's always going to be less representation from our region that is not already very represented in, in the IG processes uh, in general. So it's really important that we, we do uh, create a community and help each other. Uh, it, the IG ecosystem sometimes is a bit like a competition because there's fellowships and everybody uh, is applying for it and blah, blah, blah. But it's really not a competition. It should be more like helping each other and really trying to build a solid community. So if you have the opportunity to do that in your own country, or if you don't have the opportunity to do that in your own country yet, uh, you can always create your own IG uh, event or, or even initiative uh, at a national level. And in case you're not interested in on that, you can always join the youth observatory and help us at the regional level. So there are many doors that are open uh, in that sense, and we really need more people from Latin America uh, making an impact on that because we are not uh, very represented in, in the IGF as a whole because uh, we are in a very not privileged position <laughs> in general. Uh, but that's it. Um, just to add to Aileen Sage's request. Uh, if you have any input about the course or uh, if you, the participants, have any input about the course or uh, the youth observatory, the youth coalition, any of those youth initiatives, you can also message us through your webs, through our website, or even post it on the forum we have for this open course, and we'll be sure to take it in consideration. And uh, take your message to the people that uh, can do some changes with those inputs. Um, so just some final seconds to see if anyone else would like either to answer uh, Aileen or to make Maybe another Paola. question. Oh, Paola, please. I don't know if she is with the mic. Yep. I think she isn't with the mic. She is without the microphone because she asked me to uh, read her question. Yeah, I think it's not. So, if no one else has nothing more to add, I would like to thank everyone that was part of this initiative: the organizers, the moderators, the speakers, and of course the students that finish this learning path. Uh, this is a nice ending for a long journey of more than eight weeks in this open course. 
So it was a pleasure to be part of it with you all. And we from the organizing committee learned a lot and we hope to be able to develop courses or other learning alternatives that keep getting better and more inclusive. I would also like to mention that at the Youth Observatory website, we have a blog where we publish small articles of our members and partners. So if you are interested in having one of your texts appear at our, uh, at our website, I'm sending the document with the call for blog posts in the chat here. We will be mailing those that completed the course about the certificates and opportunities to be a part of the Youth Like IGF event. So to end this last webinar, I wish you all a good night and hope to see you in more to see you more times in other internet governance initiatives around the world. So see ya. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Have a great rest of your Saturday. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. Oh, I was muted. Bye bye. <laughs>